I'm glad to do a Bible study. We're going to have a good time tonight. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your church, your people, and Lord, that you are here, you're faithful, and that's the most important thing. We come because we know that uh, we need to hear from you. We need to be together. We pray, Lord, that you would meet the needs of your people. Um, you would give, your, give us your daily bread. You would give us what we need for today and this week. And Lord, I pray you would speak to our hearts, to our own situations, our own fears and anxieties, and that you would supply our needs according to your riches and glory. And Lord, I pray that this would be a fruitful time. And I pray, Lord, that where there is fear, it would be replaced with peace. And where there is pain, it would be replaced with comfort. And where there is sickness and disease, Lord, you would bring your healing. Uh, and where there is any bondage and sin, you would bring deliverance. And Lord, I just thank you that you are um, who we need. And as we look at the Gospel of John, I pray you would speak to our hearts and remind us how personal, close, intimate you are with us. And we thank you that you are always there for us in every situation. Um, and, you're, and now is no different. Lord, I just we lift up our, our time to you. And though it is short, we thank you that you are, are strong and you're able to speak with whether many or few words. And we thank you that um, you're, you're going to do good things today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to look at John chapter 7, uh, verse 53 to chapter 8, verse 11. So right off the bat, we're going to look at the story on the uh, um, adulterous woman. And so we'll start off with reading the text, and then I will give some, give some comments regarding it. We'll take some questions. Verse 53 of chapter 7. Everyone went to his home. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law of Moses, uh, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? And they were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go. From now on, sin no more. And so, I just, this is definitely a, a favorite text of many. And I've heard many sermons preached on it as recently as um, even earlier this um, this winter, I heard a, a message in a college chapel on, uh, on this text, um, and it is one that captures our uh, imagination. It captures, though, that we can see the compassion of Jesus here, that he comes to this woman who was caught, that they, she's, in many ways, they're saying that Jesus is the one who is trapped. Uh, they're trying to trap him, but in many ways, it's the woman who would feel very trapped. Uh, and a natural question that, would, that comes to mind and uh, is often pointed out is, um, where is the man in this story? And it is very much uh, according to the law that um, if, a, if to a man actually explicitly says, if a man is caught um, in adultery, the two will, should be taken and um, the two, and it would only be on the grounds of two or three witnesses um, that this would be, that any grounds or anything would be carried out. And so what that would look like, how people would, you know, like they would put her to death, there would have to be witnesses. But what's interesting is only the woman is taken. So where is the man? And so immediately we can see the hypocrisy of these of these. Um, Pharisees and scribes who have come, and uh, we, we look to Jesus, how is he going to respond? Because it really is a, a test for him. Um, 
what is Jesus going to do? Because Moses commanded, as in in the law, it was said that a person committing adultery should be put to death. And Jesus doesn't uh, hold any punches. Actually, he, he actually makes them wait. Um, he writes on the ground. And what is he writing? Kind of a question. What is he doing there? Like, what is, and I've heard what Jim was telling me, um, he, th and he, he knew we were going to talk about this coming up, and he says, I think it was their names he was writing down. And so they're trying to trap him, and Jesus knows them, knows the sin even of their own hearts, knows them, and is writing their David. And I thought, well, that's as good an answer probably as anything, because the Bible doesn't tell us what he writes. So as I was reading one commentary, it says, it just, it's completely speculative. You can come up with anything, almost, and say, that's what he's writing. He's writing that. Uh, he could, you know, just as easily say he's writing the woman's name. You don't know um, what, he's, what he's writing there. But the truth of, of what Jesus does here, in terms of what he says to the woman, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her, is consistent um, that he hasn't come to, in John chapter 3, God didn't send his son to condemn the world, but to save the world. And he says to everyone, come, come unto me. I didn't come to, to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We find that in the Gospel of Luke as well and, and Mark. And so what is he, what is he doing here? Um, well, he's first of all saying, you know what, you all deserve death. Uh, and this is very much consistent with the Gospel of John, that the, the wages of sin is death. Uh, and so we should be slow to desire the penalty of death applied, um, because we would first have to start with ourselves in this matter. So Jesus, straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? After they all have dropped their stones and gone their, gone their way, did no one condemn you? And she says, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. Now that's exactly, it's interesting, nearly exactly the same thing that Jesus says to the man at the pool of Bethesda in chapter 5. But there, um, the man goes away and actually um, commits a greater sin even. Goes to the Pharisees. And says, it was Jesus who, was, who healed me. And he doesn't turn away from his sin. So this one is left more open-ended. So this is a beautiful, first of all, when we look at this, this story, it's a beautiful one. And I, um, I want to first of all say it's been beloved by the church. Um, and as I mentioned, I've heard multiple sermons on this on this passage. Whereas there are many other stories in scripture, never heard a, a, past, a, a sermon preached on it. Um, and there are many that go without preaching. But I do find it interesting that this one, in most of your Bibles, you will find a little note uh, on it. And in my text, for example, in verse 53 of chapter 7, it says, Later manuscripts add the story of the adulterous woman, numbering it as John 7, 53 to 8, 11. The NIV text, for example, says the earliest manuscripts and many other ancient witnesses do not have this passage. A few manuscripts include these verses wholly or in part after John 7.36, so it's placed in a different section in John. Other, sometimes they place it after John 21.25. In other words, they append it to the end of the gospel. Sometimes it's placed actually in Luke 21, verse 38. And if you put it there, it actually looks like it lines up fairly well there. Um, and actually many placed it there. And some place it at the end of Luke's gospel as well. Luke 24, 53, placing it there. And another kind of interesting aspect about this passage is that none of the early church fathers who wrote commentaries on John's gospel includes it. They did not see it as part of the Gospel of John. Um, there can be re no real doubt that it was not an original part of John. John did not write this passage. Um, it's almost, conclu I would say, conclusive. And one of the, there's a number of reasons for that. Um, I think the, the witness of the manuscript evidence alone is powerful. That just what, it's like Mark chapter 16, verse 9 to 20, which also is not included in the early manuscripts. Um, and again, these are not to be taken lightly, these passages, because they have been beloved by the church for literally over a thousand years. 
Um, but just to, to notice a few things in terms of where this is placed in the Gospel of John, it's kind of an interesting one. You have verse 52, right? They answered him, you are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. And then you have this story, okay? So the Pharisees are, are speaking there, and really the, the, the chief priests are are key here. They're talking, there's this San, inner Sanhedrin debate going on with Nicodemus being present, who's questioning. And then at the end of this, well, for, then you have them, they go, they go their different ways. Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives. Remember, that took place at the, the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, so if we look, that's all taking place at the Feast of Tabernacles. This story, however, breaks up this and makes it so where it starts after the story of the the adulterous woman, the story resumes on the next day. Whereas if you take this story out, it continues the, the setting of the Feast of Tabernacles. But it's an interesting point because in the earlier verses, it talked, the focus was on, um, was on water. And now the focus in verse 12 of chapter 8 is not on water, but is on light. And those two aspects were, those two images or symbols were extremely important to the Feast of Tabernacles. And if so, if you read this as moving from verse 52 to chapter 8, verse 12, it actually reads seamlessly. You have this debate going on among the Sanhedrin, and they're talking, who is Jesus? Who, you know, can we believe him? And then say, just forget about the story of the adulterous woman for a moment. And Jesus again spoke to them, is how this verse sets, sets out. So Jesus now is saying, I am the light of the world. And so if you see that as following what has just has come, the narrative works so well. You know that the setting is, and we've looked at this, chapter 5 is the Sabbath, chapter 6 is the Passover, chapter 7 is the Feast of Tabernacles, and now you have this continued Feast of Tabernacles for chapter 7 and chapter 8 and chapter 9. And so if you have this break, then what happens is, you are, what feast are we talking about here? There's no new setting that is given. And the, the, the important part is it can't be part of the Feast of Tabernacles still because the Feast of Tabernacles is over. Because in chapter 7, verse 37, it says that Jesus stood up on the last, the greatest day of the feast. There's no, no more days to the Feast of Tabernacles. It's over. And so now, just returning again to the woman, the adulterous woman for a moment. Is this a good story? It's an absolutely, it's a good story. We have many good stories. It's a good testimony. It's, it's different than most other stories outside of the canon of, the, of Scripture because it's so beloved and well-known, and it's been told to generation after generation in the church. But saying that, it doesn't fit in John's Gospel. Another thing is the language that is used here is foreign to John's Gospel. It's actually like the scribe, for example, is never, you know, it's the scribes and the Pharisees, is never used in John's Gospel even one time. That would be the sole exception in the entire Gospel. But if you take that and put it in Luke's Gospel, it actually, almost all of the vocabulary is very, it's a good setting. It's kind of like the, the scribe or the, the writer of this story and it could very well go back to Jesus, is, like, is actually thinking more in terms of Luke's gospel, that it would be a good fit there. Um, but it probably wasn't a part of Luke's gospel either. So it's kind of an interesting one. And why this is important is context. We understand stories in Scripture not by taking them out and understanding them separate from everything else, but within their context. Because God has placed the key to understanding his, his word by the surrounding text so that we can't make the story mean anything and everything. And so it is an interesting one. Once we realize it doesn't actually fit that well in John's gospel, it, it, we should have caution when interpreting it. And so, for example, the writing on the ground, what are we to, meet, what are we to make of that? We have no other story where Jesus is writing on the ground. It's very much an esoteric or a kind of a thing like you can, there's a key there somewhere to what Jesus is saying. 
how can we figure out what Jesus did by writing on the ground? And I love it. It's open to speculation. It's open. We can make it say anything we want. And it's really is, it's kind of neat that way. But at the same time, we can have no certainty about what it actually means. And that's the difference between a story that's actually fits within the gospel and one that doesn't. One that doesn't is going to be open to great speculation. One that's within the context of scripture is going to have limits placed on it by its surrounding context uh, and within the gospel and the, the greater story of scripture overall. And so we just need to, I'm not saying that this is an important story and that you can't love it. And I actually have written quite a few devotions on it myself. Um, I, I appreciate the story. I think we can know by the rest of scripture that what Jesus does is not foreign to Jesus. He does forgive sin. He does go, go to the one who is actually being condemned by others and actually brings forgiveness of sins. Um, so he sets people free. Those who are trapped, he doesn't come with a word of condemnation first. He comes with a word of grace first. And so we see that about Jesus. But in terms of this being placed in this particular place in John's gospel, I don't have a lot of confidence and neither do not just a few scholars, but the great majority. No, there's very, very few scholars, if any, in the Gospel of John today who actually affirm that it actually should be right there. And many, that's why in almost every modern version, you're going to have it bracketed off. You're going to have a note placed there that just to note that this isn't in any of the earlier manuscripts. That's all. So before I go on, does anyone have any questions? Because I wouldn't be surprised. Um, if there are questions, and if there's anything I can help you with, I would love to make things clear. Was stoning for adultery still a common practice at this point in time, or just in uh, previous history before then? That's a great question. In, in all likelihood, they did not carry it out very often. It was by the law, but because of the nature of adultery, it's a very private kind of affair, and you had to have witnesses that went along with it. So who is it that's going to be a witness for adultery? It's like, in this particular case, it is very possible that the man is a witness to the adultery, the man who's actually committing this affair. Um, and so it's... Because of its private nature, the other thing is they did not want to carry out the death penalty very often. Um, and so it, what, there isn't evidence that this is carried out. It's not that it's never carried out. It's just not carried out very often. And I've mentioned that the before, how the name, of Christ, the name of God is not used in the first century. They, like We know that it was something along the lines of Yahweh. But they did not, the Jews of that day, and even, even to the present day, they didn't use that name. And the reason is, is because a vain use of the name of Yahweh would result in the death penalty. God made that abundantly clear. And so after the writing of Malachi, the Jews put that into place that, you know, we're not going to say this name anymore. We'll still revere it. It will still be holy, but we won't say it. So that kind of, you know... Um, they took the death penalty very seriously, but they also did not want to apply it if it wasn't absolutely necessary. And here you can see they're not so much concerned about the woman as they are with entrapping Jesus. And they're using her as a tool even to, to do so. So it is a good question, but there isn't a lot of evidence for the death penalty being carried out for um, on cap or even capital offenses, but in particular, for this one in particular, very often. It doesn't mean it never was carried out. Um, Stephen, for example, is put to death by a mob. It's not even, it's, it's an illegal kind. They were not to actually even carry it out. It was against the law, the way that they carried it out. Do you know, you weren't supposed to, everybody wasn't supposed to take stones and throw them. It was one big stone that would crush the person crushed their head. It wasn't like take out the stones and just cast them at the person. That was a mob scene and justice was not being given there. Um, so it's really an interesting kind of dynamic, the difference, what we see in terms of even stoning um, and how stoning was to be carried out according to the law. It wasn't like, okay, all the community get your stones and just throw them at the person until they're dead. That was really torturous. It was supposed to be very quite quick uh, a quick manner, so kind of interesting. Anyway. Can you can you also go a little bit further, uh, a little bit deeper into the chess match, the mental chess match that the scribes and Pharisees were trying to play with Jesus here? Sure. Um, 
So you, first of all, you, you have them, they, they catch this woman, they set her in the center, um, and it could be, like the NASB says, in the center of the court. Uh, it could be that as following verse 52, that this is taking place in a Sanhedrin setting. Um, so could, it's possible. And so they, they're saying to her teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery. Now, in the very act. So at this point, it could be that they could call for witnesses. There could be an actual judicial kind of um, a place to proceed here. And they're bringing to her, bringing her to him even as you, you're claiming to be like a judge or you're claiming to have this authority. What do you say then? What's your, what, what, how are we going to proceed? And it's, are you going to break the law of Moses? In the law of Moses, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? There isn't a lot of leeway here. Adultery should lead to, um, to execution. Now, what, I mean, there was a number of ways that he could have gone here. He could have said, you know, where's the man? And that would have been more of an equal kind of justice. Is Jesus looking for all those who have committed sin to be put to death? It seems to be more, though, that he hasn't come to bring judgment, but rather to bring, um, really, to bring salvation and forgiveness. And so even to those, you know, he says, um, he was without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And you know that they begin with the older ones and go on. But that idea of without sin is one that would live with integrity. Can you, with good conscience... Um, cast a stone? Are you one who is standing right before God and you're able to cast a stone with good conscience, knowing that you stand before God blameless? Now, it doesn't mean you're completely without, like, sinless. It does mean that you've lived a, a blameless or um, a righteous life, though, um, according to, uh, to God's decrees. Does that, does that make sense? So, can I, maybe you can, if, if there's anything further you'd like me to add regarding the um, legal matter, or... Well, I'm still just a little bit confused on what they were trying to, like in verse 6, the beginning part of verse 6, when it says, uh, this they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. I'm just a little, like, were they... What were they expecting him to do that they would be able to accuse him of, of what? Well, if he says, for example, no, she should not be put to death, then it would be seen as you're breaking the law. You are not, you're not saying the law should be kept. Then they would have reason for saying you don't keep the law of Moses. And that would be a place of blasphemy even. He's claiming to have authority, to be a teacher, and so on but yet he's not abiding by the law of Moses. And so he, he doesn't say that she's not worthy of death, but rather she, say, she says, you know, I don't, um, I'm not condemning you. And that goes along again with what Jesus said. What, what's interesting here is in John's gospel, you don't have anyone testing Jesus. Actually, in, that's in the other gospels. In John's gospel, you have Jesus testing others. And so, like, at the, the feeding of the 5,000, for example, he knows what he's going to do, and he asks, you know, um, he tells them, you know, you feed the people, or you, you give them something to eat. And they're like, where are we supposed to get food for all of these people? But he knew what he was going to do. So in John's gospel, Jesus is the tester of people's hearts. This one is much more like the other gospels, which they're testing him. And who is it that tests Jesus in the other Gospels? Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have the account of Jesus being tested or tempted by Satan in the wilderness. And so if you test Jesus in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you are aligning yourself with Satan. And that's one of, that's like, really, they are the worst possible opponents. If you test Jesus, we are not looking to vindicate you. We're looking to condemn you. We're not looking to, uh, to prove what you're saying is right. We're looking to prove what you're saying is wrong. So we can put you to death. Now, just note, it doesn't fit John's gospel here that well either, once again, because it's kind of interesting. They're wanting to accuse him. In John's gospel, they have all they need. And in fact, they've sent officials to arrest Jesus. 
because they feel he's already committed blasphemy. He's already declared to the Father, to, be, to God to be his Father. He's, they've already, he's already called, you know, he said he's the Son of God and so on. And so it doesn't really fit in John's gospel that they are testing him because, to accuse him, because they already have plenty to accuse him for, and he's going to give them more to accuse them of. Uh, or accuse, he's going to give them more to accuse him of coming up. When in John chapter 8, he says, before Abraham was, I am. And it's really, you can't even, as far as the, you know, that kind of a declaration, I always have been, I have lived forever, is in very much um, what he is saying there. So the, just in terms of, you know, fitting in John's gospel, it doesn't fit that well, but what they're trying to do, we understand it from the other gospels. This is exactly what the Pharisees um, have have often done to Jesus to try to test him, accuse him, but they're trying to get him to stumble, just like Satan in the wilderness. Um, and again, we don't want to be aligned with Satan and what he's doing. We want to make sure we're, we're on God's side here, um, and specifically on Jesus' side as well. I know this is a beloved passage, so I don't, I'm not trying to say this is a bad passage. You don't need to get rid of it out of your Bibles. Don't tear out this passage. Um, you can still appreciate and love this passage. Um, just, I, I think it is important to recognize, though, in terms of as we go forward, that John's gospel proceeds very well from verse 12. All right, well, let's read on here. We'll deal with this next section um, at one time. I'm, I'm going to be, you know, take a... Uh, I'm going to say we can finish John chapter 8, verse 12 to 30 here in the next 20 minutes or, or so. Well, let's, let's read together. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk, walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. And Jesus answered and said to them, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone in it, but I am the Father who sent me. Even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Then he said again to them, I go away and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. And he was saying to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they were saying to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. They did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. And I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. And so we find here um, Jesus saying right from the start, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So it's a, a, a new section beginning within a greater section. Um, Jesus fulfills the water element of the Festival of Tabernacles rituals, and here he fulfills another of its symbol, which is light. And as I've mentioned, the Feast of Tabernacles teaches us, a, or it's a remembrance, a celebration of how God brought Israel through the wilderness. And remember the stories of the wilderness. They capture those. Um, they're captured essentially with the symbols of water, God providing water. Remember even going through the Red Sea, even part of that. But also the idea of, of course, um, being refreshed and then light. And so you had the pillar of fire 
which is a great light, and you have a pillar of cloud during the day that would lead them through. Um, and this, now Jesus is the light of the world. And it is a, uh, the, in, in the Feast of Tabernacles, what was interesting is they, at the, the, at the end of the first day, four golden lamps were lit amid singing and celebration. And on the last day, the great day of the feast, these lamps would be put out. So it's likely at the end, just before these lights are put out, Jesus declares, I am the light of the world. And basically he says, and if you walk, if you follow me, you're never going to walk in darkness. And so I'm the light that is never put out. I'm the light that this even refers to. And even remember the, the cloud that would go over the tabernacle and would lead and guide them. And that's what he's saying here. He who follows me. In the wilderness, they followed the cloud. They followed the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire wherever it went throughout the the wilderness, and when it let, when it would go, the the camp would you know pick up their tent tags, get their camp ready, and follow. And it's this same way. And it's, this is what in John's gospel, this is discipleship. Discipleship is even fulfilled by the Feast of Tabernacles. Just like Israel followed God and set up camp where God said, picked up camp where God said, went where God said, that's what we're called to do. We're called to follow him wherever he goes. And of course, it means not walking in darkness. Now, what's the difference between darkness and, and light? Darkness is the realm of Satan. Darkness is sin. Darkness is evil. Light is walking in God's ways, in truth, in righteousness, in integrity. Um, and specifically is following Jesus' example, believing in, in him. And so this, this Old Testament background, even specifically regarding the Exodus, is key to this. And if we see, like we understand that Jesus says, you know, he's the light of the world. Well, we remember that, like Isaiah 49, verse 6, um, Jesus says, I will also, God says to the Messiah here, I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. We remember even, you know, in um, Luke chapter 1, verse I'm going to say 30, that remember Simeon, he says about Jesus, this is that he is a, um, a light to the Gentiles. Remember the glory of his people Israel, light to the Gentiles. And he, when holding the baby Jesus, remember he says, I have, my eyes have seen your salvation. And it's very much likely picked up here um, that Jesus is the salvation, that Jesus is the light for the Gentiles. And I was just reflecting on some of the other passages in Isaiah. In Isaiah 4 verse 5 talking about actually a new exodus that God is going to bring to, um, to God's people. Um, and verse, I, don't know, I want to kind of read the whole thing, but I won't. In, in verse 2, chapter uh, 4 verse 2 of Isaiah, in that day the branch of the Lord who is the Messiah, who is Jesus, will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. Now, if we go down, we see that it's all talking about this, a new exodus experience, and God's bringing it and bringing deliverance and salvation. Verse 5, then the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day, even smoke, and the brightness of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory, there will be a, a canopy. Um, 60, of Isaiah um, talks about this same kind of idea in terms of over and over again talking about this idea of light. No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor for brightness will the moon give you the light, give you light for you, but you will have the Lord for an everlasting light, and your God for your glory. Um, and it goes on to talk about you will have the Lord for an everlasting light, and the days of your mourning will be over. Um, and it's just, the, who is the light? Well, it's always intended that God would be the light, but it comes through Jesus Christ. God sent Jesus as his representative and actually, I mean, his, his own son um, in human flesh to show us who he is. And so Jesus declaring, I am the light, is a fulfillment of this um, of God's promise that he would be their light. And of course, Revelation chapter 21, um, that in that new city, there's not going to be any sun or 
or moon, um, but God is going to be their light as well. So, because God is with them. And so, the, of course, the Pharisees in our passage have misunderstood who, who Jesus is. Um, they've understood what he's, he's, what he said. You're testifying about yourself, they said. They said, your testimony is not true. Well, again, Jesus is declaring who the Father is. Jesus is declaring the truth, actually. He doesn't say anything of himself. He's declaring, he only says what, what God tells him to. But he goes on to say, even if I testify about, testify about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I come from, come from and where I am going. Now, this is really interesting because, remember, in the past chapter, he taught, like, cha actually, chapter 6 and chap chapter 7, this question of who Jesus is, where he has come from, is, is a really important one. And it keeps coming up. And actually, at one point, he even says, you know where I come from. But they don't. They don't. They think he's from Galilee. And we see that there's a, a right, right, there's a, a purpose for him to be from there in terms of his childhood. But he wasn't actually born. He was born in Bethlehem. They're ignorant of that. But he's even talking about something beyond that. I'm not just from this earth. I'm from heaven. I have come down from, from heaven. I've been sent from the Father. Um, and that's something that they have no understanding of. Um, so where he says, you, um, I know where I come from, he knows he's come from the Father. He knows his true nature, his true essence. He knows who he is, whereas they don't know. Um, you do not know where I come from, because if they had known where he had come from, then they wouldn't treat him this way and want to destroy him and want to kill him. But the truth is, they don't even know where they've come from. And that's what he goes on. He flips the table on them in the coming verses in this section and later on in chapter 12 to show them that, I'm from above, I'm from my father. And he tells the truth. You're from your father, and he's the father of lies. And that's all he does. And that's why, not only is he a father of lies, but he's the, he's the murderer from the beginning. And so, the same, this idea of, um, I know where I come from, is, is important for us. Do we know who, where we have come from? Because it it's, means, what is our nature? What are we about? What's our purpose? And if you don't know where you have come from, then you're likely being deceived. You do, your eyes are closed. You don't know what you're about if you don't know where you've come from. So we, are we from God? Are we really from God? Because if we're from God, we're going to do what he says. We're going to listen to the one whom he has sent. That's very clear. But if we're not from God, we're going to reject the one whom he has sent. And we're going to act like... there's only. It really seems in the Gospel of John, you find there's only two places you have... God, you know, the places to come from. You have God and you have Satan. We like to make everything like, oh, everybody's a little bit gray. And, but actually, that's part of what the prophetic word of God does is that it cuts through and it says, actually, you need to understand you're a sinner. You think you're a good person because you do a few good things. But you're not defined by a few good things. You're defined by who you're born of. You're defined by where you're going. You're defined by your citizenship. You're defined by whether you're forgiven or not. And all the, the things that you do, are they covered? Uh, are you under grace or are you under death and, and law and sin? And so the, this whole idea of where I have come from, very important. It's not just about for Jesus. It's also important for us. So Jesus says, I uh, um, you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. Why are they judging according to the flesh? Well, they don't. They have inaccurate. They're judging by appearance. They're, they have inaccurate information. They think he's from Galilee. We know that's not even the case. They have no clue who Jesus is. And we can see them doing this. He heals somebody, and they're wanting to say he's done this in almost a blasphemous kind of sense. You're sinning. Well, how does this work that you're bringing healing, and yet you're, you're a sinner somehow? Um, and he says, even if I do judge my, he says, I'm not judging anyone. That's not his purpose. But the, the, his works of righteousness will make things clear. His speech will expose sin. Light comes in, and its purpose is actually to, to invite people into the light. But it also exposes darkness and exposes our deeds and, uh, and so on. And so 
That's why he says, uh, even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I'm not alone in it, but I am the Father who sent me. And there too, he has a right to judge um, as well. And even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two is, men is true. And that's really an interesting one. This is only in the Gospel of John would we find this. The Father testifies and Jesus testifies. That's enough. We don't need any more testimony than that. And actually, when you think about it, do we need any more testimony than the Father? Really, we shouldn't. But Jesus is saying, well, I'm going to make this doubly emphatic. You can take my words and make, know that there, there's no greater foundation, no greater evidence, no greater witness than this. Both myself and the Father testifies. Now, I've mentioned before, how many witnesses concerning Jesus, how many testimonies concerning Jesus do we have in the gospel? We have seven testimonies of, of, of Jesus. Jesus testifies, the Son testifies, the Holy Spirit testifies, miracles testify, John testifies, the disciples testify. So many things testify concerning Jesus. We are, we, and we are, and we should be without excuse. Also, the one thing I didn't mention, the Word of God is a testimony to Jesus. The, the prophecies of Scripture testify concerning Jesus. So they're saying to him, where is your father? And that's, another, that's an interesting one because a lot of these things that Jesus is talking about here actually point forward to how Jesus is going to teach his disciples in chapters 14 through 16. I don't know if you noticed that. Even this idea of where I've come from and where I'm going and, and where, about now about the father. He's, Philip, I think it's Philip who says, the same, show us the father and we'll, we'll be satisfied. It's like, don't you know me? You've, and don't you understand? If you've seen me, you've seen the father. We're one. No one comes to the Father except through, except through me, he says, right? And the same thing, and you, like he says, you know the way. And they're like, How? Well, we don't know the way. What are you talking about? I am the way, right? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So the, it's interesting, these parallels that now are, and, and have been already, but that are, are laid out, introduced here to the people in general and even to his opponents, but to those who will who will enter in, and I think it's enter in even to the communion of the church, enter into his people. They will be discipled. So things that were left kind of hanging and they didn't really understand, they're going to receive teaching. Where do you find it? You find it with God's people. You find it in the church. And you find it in the intimacy that, that's there. So Jesus, in verse 20, these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. No one seized him because his hour had not yet come. And again, it's noting, as far as the Pharisees are concerned, he's blaspheming. Again and again, he's making these statements. Why aren't they seizing him? Reminding us it's because of the Father's sovereign will. It's not his time yet. And again, it should remind us, be faithful to give witness. Don't be afraid of speaking the truth to people. Don't be afraid of what they'll say to you. But instead, be faithful because God will protect you. And if it's your time, it's your time. Don't, don't let that keep you. God, um, God will restrain forces of evil um, as long as, as uh, and for his purposes. So verse 21, he, he said again to them, I go away and you will seek me and, and will die in your sin. And where I am going, you cannot come. And very sad, the idea, they're seeking him. Why are they seeking him? They're seeking even to kill him. They're seeking to do away with him and they're not finding him. Anyone who seeks him actually finds him. Anybody who comes to him finds life but those who will not acknowledge their own sin. And that's the point here. If they won't acknowledge their own sin, they're going to die in their sin. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself. Now again, remember, they're, they're judging things by the flesh. They're not understanding. No, he's not going to kill himself. Actually, who's the one that wants to murder me? Oh, that's right. It's you guys. You guys are going to, to, to murder me. So he says, so he was saying to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. So saying, and actually these, these, this too is spoken concerning the disciples. You're not of this world. Just as I am not of this world, you are not either. And so it's a really interesting thing as when you reread this gospel after becoming a Christian, you see these things differently. Um, that even as Jesus is saying this to his opponents, we understand that actually this is, us too. We're not of this world. We, this is not our home. We're in the world, 
but we're not of the world. And so, I, therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now, just that one note in verse 24, unless you believe that I am he, you will die. Now, this is something like the third or the fourth time in this gospel that we see Jesus saying, I am. And it's the, that word, ego we me, and it's the same word that God says in Exodus 3.14, uh, I am that I am. I am. And it's preparing us here. Um, we have to believe that Jesus is God. His divinity is of absolute is, is an essential part of our confession, um, and understanding that He is God. If we don't understand, we don't. We can't come to that place. We're not entering into truth, into salvation. And it seems hard. How can that be? How do you have to? God needs to open our mind. We need to humbly come and accept what Jesus has done. Everything in this gospel, we might think this is a hard thing until you realize everything in this gospel is pointed towards helping us to get there. Right? The, from the very first words, uh, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. The, this one was with God in the beginning. That's the purpose. The word was God. Seven miracles testifying to Jesus being God. Seven names of like, I am the bread of life all the way through to I am the true vine, that Jesus is God. Seven I am sayings like this one in verse 24, I am to say that Jesus is God. Why would we, why can we not believe that Jesus is God? What would possibly keep us from believing that Jesus is God? So we make it like sometimes hard. Well, what about those people who just can't get there? Well, what is standing in the way of them believing that Jesus is God? What would hold, what would hold people back? And so just think about that for a minute. Open it up to questions in a minute. So they were saying to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, he's getting a little bit frustrated. What have I been saying to you from the beginning? And this would help us to go back even to the first verses of this gospel. I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. And so he's speaking actually God's words that, hey, I haven't, just like John 3, 16, God loved the world. He sent me not to condemn us here, but to save the world. So they did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. And so Jesus says, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. And here you have another place of lifting up the Son. And I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And just going back now, he's saying, verse 28, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. Now, this is talking to, there's a double reference here. When you exalt the Son, you'll know. When you praise him, you'll know. But first of all, you have to go through the process of understanding that he died on the cross. And he died for us. He died for our sin. I put him on the cross. My sin put him on the cross. He did this for me. And that, again, he lays his life down on his own initiative. And everything that he's been speaking are been, have been the words of the Father to us, the words of love, words of mercy, words of compassion, words of grace. Uh, and if we will accept him, if we will... If we, will, if we could understand that act that, the, that Jesus died... At the Father's, even by the Father's hand of, of our sending to us, we cannot be saved. We must accept that. And so uh, when we understand that who Jesus is and that he has been submitted to the Father, then, then we, will, we will be saved. And so he says this last word about, um, in verse 29, he who sent me is with me. And it really is a... Um, he has not left me alone. Who has believed? And we're going to find there's people that say they believe in him. They go away. Who, who has believed? Well, the Father has never left him. He's always been with him. And it's a, it's a word of encouragement to us that even though it sometimes seems like we're all alone, we will have sometimes our Elijah kind of experiences, whether in our work, our co-workers, our friends, our family, wherever, that the Father never leaves us and that he's always with us. And that's this word that leaves, where we're going to end here, the faithfulness of God to us. And that when we live with a desire to please him, I tell you, he will make his way 
known he will be with us even though we might not always feel like it. He's there and he will bring us through. And I think one thing that we're reminded of is that Jesus is our example and so much of what Jesus says is actually becomes even what we are to say. That God is always with us. He's always faithful. Uh, that we know where we're from. We know where we're going. And that, those two, two spheres, we know that God has come into our life and changed us, brought life to us. And we know that the work that he's begun, he will finish, he will complete. So, praise the Lord. All right, well, let's close in a, in a word of prayer. Um, Naomi, did you want to, why don't you come over here? And you can, and I'll just, and she's going to close us in prayer. All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence this evening, and we thank you for your word, Father. We thank you that, uh, Lord, you are not there to condemn us, but you're there to save us. And so we, we pray that you will just help us to walk in your light. Lord, we thank you for uh, the faithfulness that uh, we see in, in Jesus and in the Father. And so, Father, I pray that we too would be faithful and uh, that we would be honoring to you in everything that we say and do. And we'll give you praise and glory in your precious name. Amen.